Okay, so before we get started, I would like to give a quick shout out and thanks to our showcase judges. So uh, we've got Jessica, who is the Global Startup Pipeline Lead for Techstars. We've got Brian, who is the CTO at Softworks. We've got Lieutenant Colonel John Kump, who's representing Army Futures Command. We've got Tex, who's the Director of the National Security Innovation Capital. We've got Dash, who's, with, uh, who's the Senior Operations Research Analyst with AFWorks. We've got Chris, who's an Associate Attorney at Martin LLP, and Trent, who's a CEO at Abound. So judges, uh, welcome. And uh, before we get started, just a, a quick walkthrough of what we're gonna do. We'll have the pitch go. Uh, and then we will bring up the uh, actual team members to put them on the hot seat and I'll unleash you all to ask questions. So uh, if you have no questions, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so first up, we've got Fireflight. Autonomous navigation to unmanned systems. Our team has the right combination of expertise to bring our patent autonomous navigation technology to market with over 40 years combined experience in our key customer verticals. Aaron Schmersall, a 20 year Navy veteran, has military unmanned systems and drone pilot operational expertise and did his graduate work on emerging drone based threats. I'm Carlin Younger. My background spans both business and government and I currently manage investments for a $40 billion public private partnership. Dr. Sylvie Cohn-Rich is our rocket scientist. She has a PhD in aerospace controls, was part of the L-Cross mission that discovered water on the moon, and is passionate about unmanned systems. We're further supported by our advisors with business investment and special operations expertise. The key problem holding back widespread adoption of unmanned autonomous navigation is trust. Trust it will be safe. Trust it will perform as expected and reduce rather than introduce risk to our pilots, civilians, assets, and warfighters, even in the most challenging conditions. Some of the most dangerous flight operations today involve flying at low altitudes in obstacle rich environments, such as high threat urban areas or remote areas. For example, my friend, a Marine Cobra pilot, had to often fly at extremely low altitudes through the valleys and mountain passes of Afghanistan to avoid enemy detection and ground launch threats. For context, a helicopter flying at 25 miles an hour at 20 feet can hit the ground in less than a second. My friend's only sensor to detect unknown obstacles was his eyes and his best method of avoidance, his reaction times and training. Training these pilots to fly these types of dangerous missions is costly in every sense of the word. Autonomous sensors and control inputs could potentially reduce these risks, but today they are nearly common nor trusted in the DOD. The safety just isn't there, and my friend would rather trust his eyes and his training. For unmanned systems, vulnerabilities like signal loss, GPS denial, risk of damage to assets or surrounding structures further erode the trust in autonomy. Uh, cost of asset loss is a big problem for the DOD, and commercially trust in the safety and reliability of autonomous systems to see and avoid other aircraft and obstacles is the number one issue holding back widespread drone operations beyond visual line of sight. We want to build that trust. Our patented autonomous software technology combines path and trajectory planning processes, enabling real-time in-flight trajectory updates based on live sensor information. In short, you don't need waypoints. Once you give it a destination, it will avoid obstacles and get there. Our technology is efficient and flexible. It can be customized to navigate off a variety of sensor inputs, be it LIDAR, radar, or sonar, because it can be calibrated to multiple vehicle types, ground, underwater, et cetera. Operating as a closed loop, which means it doesn't require a command and control link or persistent GPS, our software integrates knowledge of the vehicle specifications and performance dynamics to control every aspect of its dynamics, speed, altitude, direction. This technology is the next generation of trusted AI navigation. Industry standards for autonomous navigation currently are more aligned with autopilot. These follow preset routes or protocols based on the state of the device and act accordingly in a predefined way. A great example of this recently happened with a civil affairs unit we were supporting in North Carolina. They were conducting training using remote piloted drones to perform civil reconnaissance missions. When the drone lost its link to the remote control, the drone performed its, its predefined instruction, and that was to land immediately. The issue was that this happened over some of the thickest swamp North Carolina has to offer, and their unit spent days looking for it in the trees. They had actually had to call in the town power company with cherry pickers to look for it, but they couldn't find it. In the end, they had to write off a $12,000 drone, but had our software been on board, it would have been able to avoid the obstacles and land safely, even without a remote connection. 
Throughout our customer discovery, we have identified several potential use cases for this technology, ranging from invasive species monitoring through to home inspection. And the top three promising use cases we've identified are in the defense, public safety, and logistics sectors. Military applications range from fire and forget target engagement to civil reconnaissance to troop resupply mission support and even subterranean missions. Public safety applications include search and rescue, situational awareness in dense urban areas and even in the wildland, and wildfire monitoring and response. As for logistics, drone delivery companies who want to add certainty to the last mile of delivery routes through remote or dense urban areas would also benefit from our technology. The defense sector is currently the largest market segment and a key driver of growth and innovation for earlier stage technology. It is expected to continue to lead the market in terms of spend for the next four years, at which point the growth and market value of the logistics sector is poised to overtake defense especially once the FAA beyond visual line of sight regulations allow for scale. That is why we believe the time is now to prove out our technology and defense applications, given the current focus and acceleration in defense budgets for early stage autonomous systems. Looking at the entire market, the potential is huge. Our ability to work with multiple vehicle types puts the total market value at over 30 billion last year with estimated growth to 65 billion by 2025. The software market for just UAVs valued at over 1.1 billion two years ago is estimated to grow to 5.9 billion by 2025. We believe our share of this market to be at least 550 million. From a bottom-up perspective to compare, the DOD budget for this year alone for unmanned vehicles was 7.5 billion. And we know with a market this huge will come competition. But we're different from our competition in that what we don't need to reach a target. We don't need command and control links, waypoint planning, or GPS to navigate, like many current and earlier systems. But we also don't need to rely on sophisticated 4K optics that only work during the day to sense and avoid, like Skydio, or have to train a complicated neural network to identify and classify obstacles, like Shield AI. We're adding real-time capabilities to navigate in low altitudes with difficult obstacles, not just at higher altitudes, like Iris Automation. We do so with an efficient, low requirements algorithm that integrates multiple sensor packages and can meet multiple mission sets of our customers. But we know we're going to have to prove it. To get our technology from TRL level five to the next level, we plan to focus on defense applications for those smaller special pur purpose drones, given uh, the current demand, and to pursue government non-dilutive funding to do so. In order to rapidly prototype, we anticipate bringing on a coder to do the necessary software development and debugging work, a process we think should take about six months. At first, we'll use commercial off-the-shelf flight controllers, sensors, and vehicles to develop a prototype to test and evaluate the software's capabilities. In parallel, we plan to pursue key partnerships in the sensor and component space. Key to our success will be our ability to integrate our solution into both DoD and commercial systems and platforms. So we want to balance technical integration risks by exploring input bundles of sensors, inertials, and other components. To go to market, we anticipate our first and primary customers will be within the DoD as the current largest market segment and demand signal. We have some initial interest from SOCOM as well as discovered use cases across multiple branches such as subterranean intelligence, reconnaissance and surveillance. After successful testing and evaluation, we will work to secure contracts, potentially teaming with a larger prime contractor to, or an integrator to ease procurement. Maturing the technology first for DOD use also helps de-risk it and to prove out this earlier stage technology for these commercial use cases. This aligns well with industry trends and the evolution of those FAA regulations for routine beyond visual line of sight operations. We are tracking the safety, security, and environmental needs driving those regulations so that we will be well poised to commercialize when autonomous sense and avoid requirements are defined and the industry can scale. Given the flexible nature of our software, we believe we have the simplicity to integrate and compete at scale. Thank you for your time, and I welcome your feedback and questions. Okay, Team Fireflight, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you? I I'm doing well. So, I uh, appreciated the pitch, uh, but now it's time for you to get on the hot seat and answer some questions. So. Um, I'm going to kick it off with Dash, move over to Jessica, and then, then everyone else got to fight to jump in there. But, uh, but Dash, let, let's go ahead and start with you. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Uh, uh, hey, Carolyn, uh, that was a great uh, presentation. And uh, um, my questions uh, would be, uh, one of the focus is uh, GPS-deprived uh, locations. So when you me uh, mentioned the system, uh, does 
is that uh, a potential customer like for indoor uh, type of technologies uh, that uh, are uh, is you know small drones or uh, you know even ground based and water based systems but uh, are you looking into anything uh, that is uh, you know integrating pnt or any other systems into this or is it just going to be ai focused in this we're definitely looking to have our software be a capability multiplier on the navigation sense. So in those more difficult environments, whether indoor or subterranean, where Z-axis needs to be known, or there are other unknowns uh, that we need to get around, we want to make sure that we can reach the target and avoid obstacles as that key differentiator of our technology. However, we can see this being a value add to many other capability sets as well, if that answers your question. And I don't know if Aaron, you wanted to add anything to that as well. Mostly during our customer discovery, we had talked to the uh, New York Fire Department who are testing, um, you know, tunnel exploration in subterranean environments, as well as uh, drone uh, navigation within buildings, uh, which is an issue for uh, looking for uh, hot spots as well as, you know, atmospherics. So that's something we would definitely look at um, uh, as part of the integration piece, but GPS denial is those type of environments, right? Inside buildings, underground, within obstacles and uh, urban environments. So. That's like the key differentiator we're kind of looking at uh, as part of uh, the benefit to uh, going with Firefly as opposed to some of the other uh, solutions out there. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Dash. Jessica. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Carlin. Um, I had a question about how the adoption process this would be for other drone systems. So I just wanted to clarify, is your software something that can just be updated into similar drone systems already, or are you actually creating the drone itself as well? So our goal is to create that software that can be integrated easily instead of jumping right into the hardware space. In order to do that, um, again, we have to do some additional testing and evaluation with the technology, but that is absolutely the goal because we've heard loud and clear that this needs to be easy to integrate in order for it to scale. Um, to kind of de-risk some of the challenges with that, um, mm -hmm. because this is going, the, its ability to navigate will be as good as the sensors that are on board the drone. So we're looking to potentially bundle some of those capabilities together to be a quick plug and system based on the most um, idealized kind of sensor packages as well, but definitely looking at that key piece to make sure this is as easy to use, integrate, and plug and play as possible. Got it. Thank you. And we've definitely identified that as kind of a, a, a gap. So we're looking to bring on uh, someone with automatic controls, uh, developer experience, uh, mm -hmm. really understands that sensor fusion piece, because that is an, an issue, is the integration and what that kind of means for the IP. And uh, so Looking for partners in that space as well uh, for the integration part is going to be key or uh, scaling. Perfect. All right, great, great question. Appreciate that. Brian, I see you have your hand up. Let's get you in here. Yes, thank you. This is Brian Anders from Softworks. I can help you out with the sensor fusion piece. I've got a couple of startup companies that work in that space. So if you contact me after this, um, I could get you hooked up there. So, a couple of questions. So, you said you're platform and sensor agnostic. So what does your business model look like? Are you going to, you know, partner with these kind of drone makers? I know you mentioned Skydio and a couple others in there um, and, and then license it out for drone or is this kind of a one stop, you know, you're going to create a system to put on their drone or a software package to put on their drone with their existing sensors that they have. Can you explain to me kind of how you guys are going to make your money? Yeah, so uh, we're looking at all of those pathways. Uh, you covered kind of the two big ones, which is to be able to either license out just the software or to be able to integrate it to a component. Um, we definitely would love to partner with a hardware manufacturer, especially since we know that that's a very crowded space. We don't want to get into the drone manufacturing market, um, but we're exploring all of those avenues to be able to, again, meet the needs of our customers where they are and with what they need. Okay, and then one last question. What is your TRL level, your technology readiness level of, of your software? If you guys put this on like a software in the loop or RG Pilot or some of the you know simulated softwares out there, or are you just uh, kind of an idea and, and just thinking about it? So we are at a TRL level five. It's been demonstrated in a supercomputer environment. So the next step will be putting it on a drone and proving it. All right, thank you. Yeah, we've, we've seen it in simulation um, uh, in the lab. And so a lot of the technical co components are developed and, and validated. It's just getting into those real world environments, right? Where the environmentals are, are, are key. And now the sensor packages that we're gonna kind of test out, that's where we're moving towards as the prototype. So, so what kind of processor, you, what's your processing requirement for 
for what you put together right now at a TRL five? Like, is this something I could put on a Raspberry Pi, or is it something that I need, like a you know Xavier, uh, you know, graphics pro GPU? So our understanding right now is that it's a very low processing requirement. It, the simplicity of this algorithm is truly its beauty. So it can be something that's loaded onto a Raspberry Pi to function. And the idea is to do it as lean as possible. So we, had, we had, have had that discussion of putting on a Raspberry Pi and having very minimal sensors and really trying to prove out initially um, just with commercial off the shelf uh, parts. And so a Raspberry Pi load would, would be something we would look at as a testing phase. All right, well, thank you, PowerPoint. I'm really done this time, so. All right, thanks, Brian. Tex, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, thanks for including me in this. Nice to hear your pitch. Um, I, I, you're focusing on basically small drones as your entry point. <clears throat> and I'm sitting here thinking, uh, okay, I'm a manufacturer currently, a designer, builder of small drones. I know that this kind of capability is critical, and I'm already developing this capability. In many cases, I've implemented it. Why will I throw out the work that I have done and take your work? What is that going to, how is that going to advantage me as a system supplier to the marketplace? Well, I think it really just depends, again, on knowing the specifics of what you're using to function today. Um, if uh, when we've spoken to kind of players in the market, we had a great meeting with Skydio. They're doing some very impressive work on see and avoid, but it's based on 4K optics. So being able to fuse this versus different sensors for different use cases. Uh, we know the market space is crowded. We don't know what we don't know, uh, but we really do believe that this algorithm, given that it is simple, it is easy to scale and to function with this very kind of if we can do this cheaply, scale it, and make these attributable assets, uh, it could bring value to our customers. So that it's means. so the, the, the secret is in the fusion part of it that 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 somehow this capability will enable you to take input from any kind of sensor um, and then fuse it together with the rest of the sensors that are in that particular package in that particular configuration and get a superior result to. Uh, a single sensor approach, as you're mentioning, like 4K video. Is that is that the concept? Uh, that's definitely part of the concept. But one of the things that really attracted us to this technology is that it can be it can perform well based on whatever you've got. We have our preference. We really want to work with LiDAR just because of the leaps and bounds that it has made in terms of size, cost, and resolution. Um, but we know that it can work off other inputs as well and in a fused environment. So again, it really depends on the needs of the mission uh, and, and what our customers need to solve. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so that is time for the Q&A. Uh, for Fireflight, I see Chris, and Jessica raised their hand too. So that's an easy follow-up after this. Uh, but hey, Firefly, that, that hot seat was hot. You did a good job. So uh, good job and, and really loved working with you over this year. Really enjoy it. Thanks for the uh, feedback and we'll be following up. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you all. Okay, so let's move on to our next team. We've got Mjolnir Technologies. Hi, thanks everybody. I wanna to talk to you today about our company Mjolnir Technologies, which is a startup that's helping battery manufacturers make safer and more efficient batteries. I'm gonna to talk to you today about our technology that is a battery safety tech. So everybody's heard about these issues with batteries catching fire. Just last month, two firefighters were killed in China trying to deal with a lithium ion battery fire. GM also just announced that they're recalling all Chevy bolts worldwide because of a battery safety issue at a cost of $1.8 billion. Problem with batteries, lithium ion batteries, is that they are inherently dangerous. And if they're damaged, they are prone to a chemical chain reaction that can cause them to overheat and explode. We don't think of them as bombs, but in a way they, they are bombs. Like this phone, this is a bomb. Imagine that you are a soldier on the battlefield. You're being shot at by the enemy. You do not want to worry about getting killed by your own equipment. Like you've got a battery pack in your gear. You do not want it to blow up and kill you. And with the growth of electric vehicles and home energy storage, these bombs are becoming ubiquitous and they're getting bigger and bigger. So why do these batteries fail? 
in a lot of cases, it's the separator. When the positive and the negative part of the battery touch, it can cause a short circuit. And this short circuit can lead to a spark and flame. And this gets worse when the fluid in the middle, which is called the electrolyte itself is flammable. So what's the solution here? We think the answer is to make a better separator. We have a TRL5 separator called Pyrolux that improves battery safety. I'm gonna talk about the three key features that lead to the improved safety performance. So the first thing is that batteries have this problem called dendrites. They are crystal formations that accumulate over time and eventually will rupture the separator. Pyrolux, which is our technology, can be 3D printed directly onto an electrode, making it very flat as a coating, which has the potential to suppress formation of these puncturing crystal dendrites. Overall, that increases the safety and lifetime use of the battery. Second feature is that, uh, uh, that Pyrolux has higher native heat tolerance. Conventional separators start to lose integrity, usually by shrinking and deformation above 60 degrees Celsius. Pyrolux maintains integrity much higher, up to around 150 degrees Celsius, which has been tested in the lab. Finally, the third feature is that Pyrolux has demonstrated superior wettability with alternative electrolytes. Wettability means that the electrolyte is able to pass through the membrane, carrying the electric charge that makes the battery work. Remember that electrolytes are often flammable in lithium ion batteries. And the fact that Pyrolux can work with different alternative electrolyte solutions means that it could work with less flammable or even non-flammable electrolytes. There's also some manufacturing efficiency gains from the 3D printing and from the alternative chemistries. So what are we going into? The separator market is pretty fragmented, but most of the market leaders are offering carbon copy solutions, namely CellGuard and LG. Pyrolux stands out among its competition for its wettability. It enables alternative non-flammable chemistries and 3D printability. And as I mentioned, these things have a number of implications for both safety, like the dendrites we talked about, and for improving manufacturing efficiency, thereby lowering costs. We've gotten real traction so far on this, on this technology. Despite being only TRL5, there's already two companies that are talking to us about R&D collaboration, namely Rivian Automotive. They're an EV company that is looking at a $90 billion IPO later this year, and OneCharge, which is a manufacturer of forklift batteries. These companies are very interested in the manufacturing efficiency potential, as well as the safety and alternative battery chemistry possibilities. We've also started the SIBR application process for a DOE topic that looks like 100% match for our tech. Now I wanna talk about the market and how we plan to attack it. So total battery demand is predicted to be huge by 2025 and going into 2030. Virtually every major automaker is looking to add EV lines. Top of that, we have battery demand for electric grid storage. Pyrolux is well positioned to benefit as every liquid lithium ion battery is going to need a separator. Of the total battery market, about 7% of the value is the separator. We think that's roughly 12 billion. We plan to start with the lithium iron phosphate LFP battery market, which is a subcomponent that has a number of native synergies with Pyrolux's properties, such as the high heat performance. Within the LFP segment, the US market size is about 300 million. We think that's an underestimate of this technology's potential because it could unlock alternative battery chemistries that are not currently in wide use. So we've got a project plan that will enable us to bring Pyrolux to market within two years at a cost of less than $2 million. We have a path to go from TRL5 to TRL7 within nine months using SIBR funding. We think it'll cost $150,000, $200,000. And we already have the critical R&D and testing relationships established. So why us? Our team has skins on the wall in terms of bringing new products to market in uncertain environments within the government space. 
At the Federal Reserve, I launched one of the emergency lending facilities that the Fed used to support the economy during COVID-19. Chris launched a 3D printed ventilator splitter during COVID that got an emergency use authorization from the FDA. I'm gonna handle sales, Chris is gonna handle operations, and our first hire is going to be a technical battery expert who will be our CTO. That concludes our presentation. Thank you for your time. All right, so Team Mjolnir, great job with the pitch. Are you all ready to answer some questions? Certainly, but uh, Mike, I think you have to start my video. Well, we'll absolutely do that. At least we can hear you. Okay, so um, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, Brian, you got your hand up first. So we're gonna start with you and then uh, I missed Chris last time, so I'm gonna swing back to you, Chris, okay? All right, Brian. All right, yeah, first of all, great presentation, uh, guys. This is uh, Brian from Softworks. Um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with some of the uh, solid uh, electrolytes that people are working with, 3D printed solid. Would they need, would your separator be useful in those cases with a non-liquid uh, electrolyte um, or with a non-flammable electrolyte? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, the quick answer is no, we are the opposite of the solid state market. We're in the liquid uh, electrolyte battery uh, space. So while we do think that uh, Pyrolux offers some of the same uh, benefits that, you know, solid state may one day achieve uh, safety, uh, less dendrite formation, non-flammable electrolytes, uh, we believe that we can do that today with the current manufacturing capacity that's being built and is in demand now with liquid electrolytes. So uh, while we don't uh, have a play in the solid state uh, separator uh, market, we are uh, definitely going after the same benefits uh, with liquid electrolytes that are also non-flammable. Okay, and then last question. You guys talked about how you would lower manufacturing costs uh, using your kind of 3D printed separator. Talk to me a little about how that lowers the cost from the current methods. Yeah, so in, in a nutshell, we take uh, one or two process steps out. So it is a faster process as well as uh, it allows some benefit in removing the adhesive layer. So while the manufacturing process itself is cheaper, it also provides value in every micro uh, micrometer that you get out of there and adhesive or coating layer is extra uh, energy density space. So it is cheaper in the actual processing, but also creates space for uh, the more valuable battery material. All right. Thank you. And I do have uh, some folks that may be interested in your technology. So please reach out to me after this. Thank you. Thank you much. Another win. All right, Chris. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, so great pitch. Um, you know, based on the pitch analysis, I think demonstrates that a lot of the household names are not currently able to offer or compete with the key characteristics of your technology. Uh, do you have any knowledge or understanding of whether there are other startups or early stage companies out there that are either doing something that's similar to you or maybe not the same, but competitive in terms of the up and coming market? Yeah, Chris, thanks for that question. And I think, uh, you know, our research led to diving deep with a couple of competitors and even, you know, open the door to talk to one that's, you know, pretty active in this space. In tech, you may have seen on the, the pitch, uh, they are working in this space. Uh, they are trying to do something similar. They've been trying to do 3D printing uh, and they haven't been able to achieve the wettability um, or the speed, uh, yet to be able to do that. So, uh, there are competitors and there are big competitors trying to do the same thing. So it is a competitive market. Um, and we do think, uh, the big difference is that the heat tolerance with Pyrolux is native. So every other competitor uses a ceramic coating, uh, on the outside of their common separator to achieve the same benefits that Pyrolux does. And if I could just add to what Chris said, the, the, wet, the wettability is potentially a game changer. The, we didn't focus on it as much during the pitch because it's lower TRL. But if that's something that can be proved out, then you can open up a whole range of other battery chemistries that people are not looking at seriously right now. 
So it's a, it's a moonshot, but it's real. It's great. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. We'll move on to Trent and then John. Hey guys, exciting pitch. I mean, assuming uh, that it's as, you know it's not too good to be true, and it's, it's what you say. Um, what do you feel like is the rate limiter uh, for this? For you know, for the for the next phase or the first phase of commercialization, you named a couple big names, or at least Rivian. Like that's potentially a huge demonstrator for that industry. What do you feel like at a business standpoint is your 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 first kind of limit gate that you have to navigate? So we're under NDA with Rivian, so there's a limit to what we can say. I'll just say that for them, integrating anything into their process, which they're looking at a lot of different stuff, it has to work. Forget about the technology. Like it, it could make the sun turn blue and that doesn't matter. It has to be something that, be, that can be manufactured efficiently. So in terms of the business plan, Best case scenario, we could do a strategic partnership with Rivian and start prototyping stuff alongside their manufacturing process. More realistic, it's going to be we get the, the Cibber money, get this to TRL7, which we think we can do with Cibber. And then we have, we're, we have uh, relationships with Forge in Massachusetts and Cedar down here at Texas State in San Marcos near Austin. And they have like manufacturing platforms where we could demonstrate that, hey, we can take this now proven in a cell phone battery and scale it in an efficient way. And if we can start to do that, then somebody like Rivian becomes very interested. But if we can get the Cibber money, we might be able to get them involved sooner. One Charge too. One Charge wants to build a domestic entire battery pack. They right now, they import pouches and assemble the packs, but they'd like to get into cell manufacturing themselves. And they're looking for partners. And they're in the LFP space. So if they're looking at high heat applications, that's why we think there might be a natural partnership here. It's still, it's not certain, but at least people are interested in talking to us. Thank you. Thanks, Trent. John. Hold on, I had to get my, uh, my mic to work. Uh, just a couple of comments. You know, as you start looking at doing, uh, you know, work within the, the DOD or engaging with DOD, I take a look at, you know, kind of how you frame your, your problem, right? Like coming from like an Army Futures Command perspective, I'm not sure if we believe that we're strapping bombs on all our soldiers, right, with uh, lithium ion batteries. And so I, I would just take a look at how you frame that and, and, and maybe look at, you know, the extension of battery life or, or, or something and, and how that is relayed uh, to your target audience. And then I got a question about the team. Usually when, when we take a lot of pitches, right, we, we usually run into teams that are kind of developed from kind of technical guys with no sales experience. And it, and it seems like uh, with your current team, you're, you are a bunch of sales guys with limited technical experience. And so I'd like to just get a comment on that. Well, so the, the team is a function of, of who joined the program, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm squarely blaming Mike Bynum for that. <laughs> um, no, John, no, but we'll say, though, that uh, while it is true, we, uh, we are business guys now, uh, I do have former experience being a Navy nuke, uh, learning quickly and diving deep into uh, some of this stuff to just enough to be dangerous uh, from my past background, so... Uh, I think, you know, we do know that that is a, a big, big gap that uh, we're going to be closing in the near term. And the first person that we want to bring on is a strong CTO with hard battery experience. And we know that that's a major gap for our team. And it's the first thing that we have to solve. And we probably could do it with silver money. All right. Thank you. Be happy to jump on that bomb anytime for you guys. Uh, Tex, we'll wrap up with you. Yeah, so um, just a comment and a question that, to that point about the staff, just uh, please don't underestimate the challenge of finding a really highly qualified uh, technical CTO type for batteries, since this is one of the hottest markets in the States and you're up against everyone else who's doing this. So it's going to be a challenge. Um, my question is, 
from the um, mega scale manufacturer's perspective, is this a drop in technology? If not, what do I have to do to adapt my manufacturing process to use your product? Thanks, uh, thanks, Tex, and we definitely do appreciate the uh, the challenge there and finding the right uh, right sure. teammate to fill that gap. And I will I will say that uh, it does offer the potential to be a direct drop in technology, but that's not where the the game changing benefits are. Uh, so it would have to be put into the uh, the manufacturing process upstream, but we do think the uh, ability to streamline that process and remove a couple of steps uh, makes up for the uh, slight change to their uh, manufacturing process today. But that is something we'll have to prove out uh, at scale as we go a little deeper with these uh, potential partners. Then, then separately, I'd love to find out more about that. I'd like to understand that, that better from you guys. Definitely, we can follow up with offline text. Great, thank you. All right, Team Mjolnir, great job. You are officially off the hot seat. Thanks, Jonas. Okie doke. So let's move to our final presentation. And that is going to be from Gale Sun Technologies. We're Gale Sun Technologies, and for the last few months, we've been working with inventors from the Air Force Research Lab to develop and commercialize the world's first flexible, wearable ultrasound technology. The Air Force has a problem. They have the task of moving critically injured and wounded patients thousands of miles across the globe. However, medicine at 30,000 feet is not the same as medicine on the ground. They work in dark, cramped conditions, monitoring multiple patients simultaneously. Meanwhile, the vibration, noise, and turbulence render many standard methods of patient monitoring completely useless. That is what this technology was developed to address. But there's a bigger problem. Every day, people around the globe get into car accidents, they take large falls, they get shot, they get stabbed, and a million of them die from internal bleeding every year. The problem is that things like heart rate and blood pressure don't tell the paramedics that there's a problem until the patient has lost more than 30% of their blood. That's a half a gallon of blood loss, half a gallon before they even know that something's wrong. But ultrasound can identify internal bleeding sooner. In fact, it's so effective that studies recommend conducting an EFAST exam to screening for internal bleeding every 15 minutes while the patient is en route. But trauma incidents aren't simple. In 32% of cases, paramedics didn't do it at all because they just didn't have time. That's a problem because it would have resulted in a change in management for 37% of patients and a complete change in destination for 21%. That means that if we could develop a way to monitor for internal bleeding while letting the paramedic do the rest of their many jobs, we could positively impact 2.4 million people every year. And that's what we plan to do. Flexible wearable ultrasound imaging is a massive leap forward in the medical toolkit, not only in trauma transport, but in the hospital and beyond. This technology utilizes ultrasound signals passed between elements of an array to identify its shape and produce a coherent image. This allows the transducer to adhere to and flex with the skin and the body as it moves. We currently envision a belt or strap, not unlike a blood pressure cuff, that EMTs and physicians can apply to the body and leave attached. This alleviates a key requirement of all other types of ultrasound imaging. The operator doesn't need to manually maintain an image. They can perform a single step and move on to other tasks, other patients, or other locations. There's an extensive market that we're capable of addressing with an initial target customer of DOD aeromedical evacuation. We took a very conservative approach to this bottom-up analysis. The ideal method would have been value-based. However, given the stage that we're currently at, we chose to use next best alternative. As such, we see this as a lower bound for our market size. As we continue to grow and mature this technology, we will have the opportunity to address a massive number of problems across multiple medical specialties. Now these focus areas did not come out of thin air. In addition to deep academic research, 
We spoke with over 60 potential customers and industry experts, including a 30-year Army veteran and physician who called this technology, quote, a potential game changer. There are a number of companies operating in the ultrasound space that we've categorized here as the incumbents, the traditional ultrasound players such as GE Healthcare and Philips. They control about 95% of the ultrasound market. There are new entrants such as Butterfly who are rapidly growing their market share. They succeeded by simply offering a better value proposition than what the incumbents were offering. Our initial product offering will be focused on identifying internal bleeding and as such will not have the multifunctionality of other ultrasound options. However, we intend to add additional functionality over time. Additionally, we're di differentiated in capabilities by being the only ones offering remote and hands-free monitoring. It's important to note that Butterfly does intend to enter wearable ultrasound uh, market, currently projected for 2023 but specifically they are focused on at-home monitoring. We do have some challenges that we'll need to overcome moving forward. Imagine, or excuse me, image clarity and speed are key in the technical space. Based on background research of adjacent technologies, we anticipate the first to be a low hurdle. Speed will be more of a challenge, but we again, don't see any hard barriers. Additionally, our earliest applications needing an image every 15 minutes will have a high tolerance for this metric. Given that this is a class two medical device, we will need to obtain FDA clearance and we intend to pursue a 510K along ultrasound device path three. This is an area we are focusing some attention uh, on in the near future in order to clarify, reduce risk and ensure we're taking the best approach. A longer term concern as with all medical devices is reimbursement. Since we're focused on the military market, this is a lower priority issue, but something we are considering for our long-term goal of entering the civilian market. Finally, design is a key consideration that we're beginning to address informally using current ultrasound equipment and will continue to be a developmental focus. Ensuring that this technology is not only technically effective, but built in a way that is easy to use while balancing cost with the required functionality is a critical focus area. We do have a developmental timeline and a path to market. We intend to pursue an STTR, currently focusing on the National Science Foundation. We're fortunate to have connections with the University of Pennsylvania Medical School and Hospital and have had significant interest in working on this concept, including a trauma surgery fellow who specifically stated that he wants to do research and help get this to market. Ensuring that we have a, a team that's prepared to complete the development of this technology is critical. And we're in the process of addressing our current gaps. We're beginning to have conversations with candidates and we'll have a complete team by the end of this year. However, our founding team as it stands is well-balanced, covering highly technical military operations, multi-specialty healthcare and science-centric PR and IT. Gale Sun Tech is an innovative force in ultrasound. We very much appreciate the assistance we've received through the Defense Innovation Accelerator and FedTech and are prepared and excited to move on to phase three. All right, team Gail Sun, rounding out round one. Are you all ready to answer some questions? Yes, we are, Mike, thank you. Okay, well, uh, I see some hands are up. Jessica, let's start with you. I'll move over to Chris and then Dash. Yeah, thanks so much for that presentation. Um, I had a few questions about your accuracy. You had mentioned that there was a little bit of concern for that. Um, what are your plans in the future to test that out to see um, what your accuracy level is? And what are your projections in terms of how that compares to your competitors? Um, what percentage should we be expecting for accuracy? In terms of how we, hi, can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep. So in terms of what we're looking to do at this point in time, given that the initial sample um, from the laboratory perspective was tested on a round cylinder, the objective at this time is to go into research and development mode where we will work towards uh, you know, partnering with a current organization to integrate the ultrasound software into a current device, um, uh, an existing device, or 
um, work towards uh, researching uh, and working with an engineer um, to develop a, uh, a, a projective, uh, I'm sorry, to develop a, uh, a testing device that we can utilize on a dummy to really assess where, you know, where we stand. Um, I know there's a couple of ways that we intend on approaching this. Uh, the first approach was to partner with an existing or with an incumbent um, hardware developer, um, mm -hmm. or two, um, work with a, an emerging ultrasound or an emerging uh, flexible device manufacturer, such as University of San Diego or uh, Pulsify, for example, or work towards uh, you know, developing the, not only the agnostic software, but the, the device on our own. So uh, currently where we stand, we're not in a position where we're able to you know, accurately state what that is going to look like, honestly. Okay, thank you. All right, great question. Chris. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, and Gary, you may just have touched on this a little bit with the partnerships. Um, understand from a startup perspective why you're focusing on more narrow functionality approach to get off the ground instead of pursuing multi uh, functionality from the outset. Um, but given that approach, uh, will potential purchasers essentially need to buy both an existing competitor's technology and your technology for your functionality from the outset? Um, and if so, how do you view that uh, affecting your marketability of your product? I'm sorry, and, and let me just make sure I understand the question correctly. The, the question was being able to, in terms of market penetration, being able to not only having a manufacturer to sell their product, but also sell our product, meaning ultrasound software simultaneously. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, essentially, because I know you mentioned not getting multifunctionality right at the outset. I think taking a more narrow approach and, um, you know, if your product can't have the multifunctionality to replace everything that an incumbent product offers from day one, you know, whether that's requiring people to essentially have that incumbent product and have yours at least until you move to multifunctionality. Okay, sure, sure. So, I mean, I think our approach was conservative in nature. Um, as it relates to as it relates to functionality, um, given where we currently are and some of the limitations um, associated with our ability to truly test the functionality of the technology from a medical standpoint, uh, the objective is to better test this particular product out, test the technology out um, in terms of confirming um, the multifunctionality of of the technology alongside a uh, an actual device. Um, I do believe realistically um, coming from a healthcare perspective that once we're once we're actually able to begin testing they, we should get to a point where there is multifunctionality involved where we're able to not only assess from a aeromedical evacuation standpoint or a ground transport standpoint but eventually getting to the uh, the patient monitoring standpoint as well so I, I do believe we will get there it's just a matter of testing out the functionality and getting to a position where we're able to really assess where we are and where we can take it Thank you. To add a little spice there, the uh, so it's going to be a trade-off. You're correct initially, and that's where uh, one of the big focuses is getting to what the actual true value of this is, um, and identifying what this what the impact is uh, in terms of uh, impact to care from a from a value perspective, and uh, balancing that with the costs of it and the, the challenges of the fact that uh, the we are going to have to ask our customers to to buy this in addition to what they currently have. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I, um, I'm not a medical expert or any, uh, or an ultrasound expert or anything, but I had a question is, um, uh, is this uh, more of a software that can be integrated with any sort of uh, device that uh, is currently being used by people or is this separately like the, uh, as I saw in the uh, uh, presentation, uh, more like a tummy tuck belt sort of thing? Is that uh, the approach that it's uh, it's a software that is going to be integrated or are you looking to create this as a uh, belt, some, some sort of a wearable device that is not like a watch? Um, sure, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Uh, it's uh, right now what it is, I mean, we are, we're fundamentally a flexible ultrasound company. So what we, the technology that we've been, you know, blessed to work with here is a algorithm, right? So it will sit in the software chain of 
one would think it could sit in the software chain of any device. Um, if you saw the slide on the competitors, uh, and uh, Jason noted that, you know, there's 95% market share taken up by the big guys. Well, they don't let you, they don't let us open, they don't let you open up their software and, and play with them. So yes, a potentially a partnership later on with that uh, to integrate it, that into, you know, existing systems that we talked about that. But uh, right now, what we would look to do is to be able to be able to have the entire thing from soup to nuts. Um, so yes, be able to create our own flex cuff wire, wired flex cuff, because if we're going to do aromatical, we're going to need to be plugged in and not, or not wireless. So. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. And Brian, did you have your hand up? We can close out with you. Sure. I'll put it back up. Um, so yeah, I, I was looking at your, your product there, right? The, the belts, I guess, as they were referring it to. So normally with ultrasound, right, there's kind of a gel that you need to make that device to body transition. Mm -hmm. um, what is your kind of plan for that with this belt device? Uh, well, because of the belt itself, the, the contact that you need to make with this the electric, whatever they call it, the contact that you need to make with the skin, applying the belt, cinching it to the point where that contact is made, you might only have to apply the gel on the surface there. And then once that contact is made, there's no reapplication of the gel, right? So there, there may be a gel in there to, to you know, get that initial contact. And, but once that contact's made, there shouldn't be any additional nest need to, to remove and re-gel. Okay, and then the last thing, so it's a pretty wide area you've got across there. Are you looking like a beam steering type array to be able to pinpoint an area in the body? Or are you just gonna grab the whole midsection and then kind of look at it on the, on the video there? I mean, both of those seem like they're applicable for our technology, but really what, what this, this uh, <clears throat> algorithm does is it gives us the opportunity to place this, uh, the transducers on any surface, right? Not any pre-programmed surface. And so you, depending on the size of the patch, you know, uh, right now we're gonna be looking for fairly low quality sort of 2D imaging to monitor uh, blood flow and potential, uh, you know, blood seepage. Um, further on down the road, we would, we would look to get a little bit more fancy to be able to put together, you know, 3D moving images. All right. Well, great presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you, judges. Okay. So that is a wrap for Q&A for the first round. Uh, I want to give thanks to Fireflight, Mjolnir, and Gail Sun. Great pitches, great answers to Q&A. Uh, so judges, I'm going to let you off the hook for about 30 minutes as we move on to our fireside chat. Uh, but please fill, fill out your forms that you have, and we will see you again for the second round.